Hello and welcome to Spencer's Library. I'm Claudia and today I want to talk about classics, specifically classics from the early to mid 20th century, because I have been reading a lot of those recently and it's brought my love back for books from that time period. And I want to talk about them specifically as a sort of way to enjoy classics that's a little bit more easygoing than uh, reading classics from earlier time periods in my opinion. All of this is obviously in my opinion. Hello, if you're new to this channel and you don't know, I'm quite opinionated about classics. I love Victorian classics as much as the next booktuber and I love Jane Austen and Regency classics even more possibly. But when I'm after something comforting, something easy, when I'm after something that even though it might be a new to me author or a new to me genre even, then I gravitate towards classics from the 20th century. And specifically, I'm talking about classics published sort of between 1900 and 1960, although we are not defining these time periods exactly. If I say early 20th century classics, then that's not quite precise enough. And I say mid 20th century classics, then that excludes the earlier works and so on. So we're just talking about books from the first six or so decades of the 20th century whenever I pick up a book from that period, even if it is something that is new to me in terms of author or in terms of genre even, um, then that's an easy access point into a, a certain type of book. And that's why in this video I'm going to make a case for those classics. Of course no one has to read classics in the first place and if you've been around for a while you know that as much as I love classics, I don't think that they are an essential part of anyone's specific reading habits. I don't subscribe to the idea of the canon as such, and I don't see classics as any sort of higher form of literature than a contemporary fiction. But I personally really like classics because I enjoy old books. I'm a historian and I find it interesting to see the world through the eyes of authors from the past. So this is just your little crash course on the Spinster's Library philosophy about classics. I think I've actually made a whole playlist of videos that talk about classics in the abstract and, and my very opinionated uh, videos about them. So I'll, I'll link that in the description box if you're <laughs> interested in more of my ramblings about classics. So if you are a reader of contemporary fiction who wants to dip their toes into classics but might be a little bit intimidated by oh, I'm not going to slag off Wuthering Heights yet again. I think the fans of Wuthering Heights have suffered enough by my hand. But I've said it now. So anyway, if you are new to classics but you're a little bit intimidated by the sort of book that tends to get the top spots on every sort of newspaper's must-read list, then consider looking a little bit later in the history of literature and picking out something from the 20th century. What I find so comforting about 20th century classic and exciting at the same time is that they hit that sweet spot between being old and therefore giving me that distance that I like about classics, that real feeling you get that this was written by someone who had a very different life uh, than I did, but also they are familiar enough in their language, in their setting, and in their storytelling that it doesn't feel like uh, you have to put any effort into reading them, like I sometimes feel, for example, with Victorian classics. And I think that sort of storytelling aspect is often not talked about when we talk about classics. We, in the 21st century, are used to a certain way of stories being told. And even if you don't study story structure in a sort of academic way, like I don't, you will be familiar with specific story beats, the rise and fall of tension in a story arc, the way that sort of main plot and side plots interact, the place the protagonist has in the narrative, the way the story is told from a certain point of view, all of these things that have become conventions over the last decades uh, feel familiar to us and in fact they feel so familiar to us that we don't even notice them when we read a modern book. We just accept this as this is the way that a story is told. And then when we dive into a Victorian classic, for example, or a Regency classic that is suddenly told 
from an omniscient point of view or where the narration hops from character to character and tells so many different stories all at once where it doesn't feel like a plot has a specific direction where the tension arcs aren't what we are used to then we experience the story in a sort of uncanny way like we don't quite know why it feels weird what we're reading and why it doesn't grip us in the same way that a modern book does and some would say that that's just the way the novel has developed that books of the modern day are just objectively better because they have gone through an evolution i don't think that's the case i think it's just differing tastes and differing ways of consumption. If you think about someone in the 1820s reading a book, they would have read it in a very different context to us. Presumably they would have spent more time reading than we do. Then when you get to the Victorian period and the popularity of serialized novels, you get the idea that stories were consumed differently in the past. And that, I think, explains those different structures and why they feel a little bit alien to us. So 20th century classics, the books that I'm talking about in this video, are in their storytelling conventions a lot closer to what we are used to with contemporary fiction. Another thing that is familiar to us uh, in a way that earlier classics are not is genres. I'm not a historian of literature and obviously there are many earlier examples of genre fiction. I mean you only have to look at the work of Mary Shelley to find so many modern conventions of science fiction and dystopia and zombie stories and all sorts of things. But I feel like in 20th century classics those genres crystallize out a little bit more than in the previous century so that when you pick up a thriller from the 1950s it is recognizably a thriller and if you pick up a, a detective mystery from the 20th century it is recognizably that and a romance is recognizably that and so on and i think that makes it more easy for us to choose books that are new to us and have certain expectations of those books and then those expectations being fulfilled which is satisfying and comforting now I've got to say that I'm not that adventurous with my genres. I'm very comfortable in uh, certain genres like, for example, dystopian fiction I quite enjoy. And there is a whole wealth of 20th century dystopian fiction that is just gorgeous. And with the knowledge of hindsight, you can see where all of that gorgeous dystopian fiction comes from, from the uncertainties of the various wars hot and cold that uh, the authors of the 20th century have gone through and that they then put these fears into dystopias that we still recognize and that we still relate to today. Obviously there's the big hitters like uh, Orwell. I'm personally a huge fan of John Wyndham who is not exactly unknown uh, but he's not often mentioned with the sort of greats of 20th century dystopian fiction. I think because his stories tend to be disastrous, yes, political as well, but they focus a lot on the personal. You know, they still deal with the world falling apart in various horrendous ways, but uh, I find them very accessible and they're also quite fun for dystopian and post-apocalyptic novels, which understandably tend to be more on the serious side of things. But something like The Crack and Wakes or The Day of the Triffids has a humor about it that I really enjoy reading. He's one uh, author whom I can recommend if you are wanting to dip your toes into 20th century classic dystopias and post-apocalyptic novels and also science fiction in general. Another book that you will recognize the title of but you might not necessarily have read is I Am Legend by Richard Matheson. I think this one's from the 50s. It's a very short book. I'm not sure if it classifies as a novel or a novella. I have not seen the adaptations. I've only heard that the adaptation, uh, especially the one from this century, is very different from the novel. I can't really speak to that because I haven't seen it. But I Am Legend is such a compelling little book. It's gripping and horrifying, but also fun in a way that zombie stories tend to be. This is the story of the last survivor of the apocalypse, and the apocalypse in this case is basically everyone turning into zombie vampires. They're not called zombie vampires, but that's essentially what they are. They are undead and they feed off people's blood. 
and this one man trying to survive. It has all of the tropes of survivalism. It's got the walking around with a shotgun, shooting zombies. Actually, I cannot remember if it's a shotgun or if it's like a, a silver stake. I think it might be old school vampire killing silver stake type thing. Either way, it's horror and it's apocalyptic, but it's fun and compelling and reads very modern. And that's something that all of my favorite 20th century classics have about it, the sort of easiness of reading them. If we move away from the apocalypse, zombie, dystopian sci-fi world into other genres, one that I think has produced some excellent books in the 20th century is the psychological thriller. And one of my favorites is The Talented Mr. Ripley by Patricia Highsmith, which has been made into a movie that I have actually seen. I don't remember that much about the film. I don't have a very good memory for movies in general and I have a very short attention span. So just don't trust my opinion on films like ever. But the book is super fun. It's the sort of book that if I had read it without knowing when it was published, I might not have been able to guess the decade. It has a weird timelessness about it, while still obviously being heavily grounded in the period. And The Talented Mr. Ripley has this really compelling prose. It's this... Oh, I don't want to spoil it too much about it, but it's the story of a um, man who is not what he pretends to be and does some rather horrifying things. <sighs> that sounds like every thriller ever. I'm not one for spoiling classics because they are just fun stories and I want you to experience them yourselves by reading them. So that's a recommendation if you are a fan of psychological thrillers. Then on the more subdued end of things you've got books like Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier which is this story of a young girl who marries into this old ancient uh, family and household and has to move into this creepy old manor house in Cornwall where all sorts of secrets are kept. This book hits you with some twists right at the end. It's beautifully atmospheric and then becomes an absolute page turner in the second half. Again, it has that prose that doesn't require you to put any effort into it. You can just absorb the novel and enjoy it for what it is and you don't feel like you're reading a historical artifact. I don't mind reading historical artifacts. That's why I enjoy, for example, non-Jane Austen Regency fiction, which is one of those things that a lot of people who love Jane Austen and then try and read something from a time period that's not Jane Austen are horrified by how different it is and how difficult it is to read. I like reading those novels as historical artifacts, but what I find comforting about an author like Daphne du Maurier is that it doesn't feel like reading a historical artifact, it's just a bloody good book and it doesn't matter if it was published in the 1930s, 40s, 50s or whenever. So I read Rebecca and that was my first Daphne du Maurier book and then over the years I've slowly been exploring her other work and every single book of hers that I've read appears to be in a completely different genre. So I read Jamaica Inn, which has the creepy vibes of Rebecca, but is a lot more straightforward. It also has more of an element of romance in it. And it's a historical novel. So here we move on to our next genre that I want to talk about, historical fiction. Historical fiction from the 20th century is one of those things where you can actually tell that the conventions have changed quite a lot. Modern day historical fiction, from what I understand, is a little more concerned with an accurate portrayal of the past that still conforms very much to our modern sensibilities. It's a balancing act that historical fiction authors of today have to strike between telling a story that feels like it might have actually happened in the past, but that will still appeal to a modern audience. Writers in the 1930s, 40s and 50s or whenever, they, they didn't have such concerns. They would just pluck heroines as they would write them in a contemporary book and put them in the past. There is a sort of fun and campness about it. You just basically ignore that maybe that story wouldn't have happened like that and just enjoy the ride. Books by Daphne du Maurier that fall into that category are Frenchman's Creek, which I finished just recently, which is just a straight up escapist historical romance about a sexy French pirate. Then there's also the aforementioned Jamaica Inn. Is it aforementioned? I was thinking about it. I'm not sure if I said it. 
uh, which has a little bit more of a darker edge to it. I've also just started reading Georgette Heyer books. I've just started reading. I read one and that was the one that was recommended to me by the readers, the readers of this channel, the viewers of this channel who have read her work. So I've just finished reading The Unknown Ajax. Interestingly, I asked for recommendations for Georgette Heyer Regency romances, and that was the one that was recommended to me the most, with a note that it's not very romantic. Which is suddenly a choice, considering I asked for Regency romance recommendations. But either way, it isn't very romantic. I still enjoyed it a lot. And again, it has that interesting mix of a book where you can tell that the author really knows the time period. The, the details that are worked into the book are very vivid and presumably very accurate, but the characters and the way they interact with each other is just straight up taken from the 20th century. And I kind of love that. Historical fiction from the 20th century? Definitely a genre that I'm going to be exploring more of. So do drop your recommendations in the comments if you have any. Young adult fiction isn't really a classification that was around at the time that these books were published. However, there are some that really tap into those same vibes that we love about young adult fiction today. And the book that I always mention in that context is I Capture the Castle by Dodie Smith. It's the perfect season now to read it. For me, it's a springtime novel and it has a lot of the elements that I like about young adult fiction as a sort of self-awareness, about uh, the teenage protagonist and her struggles. It's told in first person. In fact, it's told in diary form. It's a diary novel and the humor of it, but also the sort of sense of longing and a melancholy, just a beautiful mix of emotions that I feel like are often separated out in fiction for adult readers but that blends together so seamlessly in young adult books and something like I Capture the Castle has that. I personally like sort of half satirical novels. I'm not the biggest fan of purely comedy type novels that are only there to make you laugh. I love comedy on television but in book form it's an acquired taste. No, that's not the word. It's something I read sparingly. However, I like books that tell stories with a sense of humour and two authors that I want to mention in this context are E.M. Forster, whose entire work I've read and in fact I've made a video about where to start with E.M. Forster if you're not familiar with his books. That will be linked in the description box. He has this skill of telling big stories that combine satire, romance and drama in just such a beautiful, compelling way. The prose is gorgeous. Obviously he wrote his books at the beginning of the 20th century and that does reflect a little bit in the prose so they feel a little bit more classic -y than some of the other books I've spoken about but I find them relatable on a really deeply human level that even when you don't have anything in common with a character and the world they inhabit is so very different from the one we inhabit there is still a deeply human connection that you feel with them. I love that about his books as well as the humor that's in them, the detail that's in them and the uh, just I can't remember what I was trying to say. What have you got to say? Are you very hungry? Oh, bless you, it is your feeding time. I won't be long now. <laughs> right, she's going to watch me there just to make sure that, that I won't let her starve. Who else did I want to mention in this context? Nancy Mitford. I just started reading her work as well. I read one of her books, The Pursuit of Love, and it has a similar satirical style without the depth. I would say that Ian Forster has, but still uh, just as entertaining and just as fun to read. Uh, detective fiction, we cannot talk about 20th century fiction without mentioning Agatha Christie, but also Arthur Conan Doyle wrote a lot of his Sherlock Holmes uh, works in the 20th century, not in the 19th century, even though we think of him as a quintessential Victorian author. But my favorite uh, Sherlock Holmes story, The Hound of the Baskervilles, was actually published in 1902, so we're just in the 20th century for that one. The 20th century really is when detective fiction established as a genre that we know today. Those conventions, those tropes that we love so much about it, were built then. So if you're a fan of modern day detective fiction, you absolutely uh, will enjoy 
classic detective fiction from the 20th century. I cannot recommend too much in that genre because I'm pretty new to it as well, but you won't have any problems finding Agatha Christie recommendations list and similar on booktube. Let me see what else I've got written down on here. Fantasy! Okay, well, you know the Lord of the Rings exists. I am not that into fantasy. I feel like this is something I want to change. And I have not, in fact, read The Lord of the Rings, but obviously it is the uh, single most influential work of mid 20th century fantasy fiction. So unfortunately, when it comes to fantasy literature, uh, all I can say is <laughs> it exists. <laughs> Please put your recommendations in the comments. And yes, at some point I will read The Lord of the Rings. Don't be ridiculous. You don't need to scold me about that. I am aware. What I'm trying to say when it comes to 20th century classics, in particular those in the first half and a bit of the 20th century, is you can pretty much take your favourite books, uh, your favourite author, your favourite genre, your favourite type of story, and you'll find something in the 20th century that was the predecessor of that. So you take something that you're comfortable with, and then you can search for 20th century fiction uh, of that genre, and I can guarantee that you're going to find something you like. This is how I started reading 20th century classics. Uh, for me, the gateway drug was the dystopian novels, and I've read uh, a few dystopian novels from the time period. In fact, I've got videos about that as well, which I'll link in the description box. There'll be loads of videos on related topics linked in the description box, so definitely have a look in there. And via the dystopian novels. I've explored more 20th century fiction. I'm not done yet. I'm going to keep exploring 20th century fiction. And I can only encourage you to do the same. So at the end of this slightly chaotic video, let me know your favourite 20th century novels. Let me know any genres that I completely left out here, because I'm sure there are some. Literary fiction! I haven't spoken about literary fiction, obviously, because I've been focusing on genre fiction. But, um, I'm sure you've heard of Virginia Woolf. I was just reminded of this absolutely absurd conversation I had on Twitter once, where a guy just did not believe me that Virginia Woolf was an English author, which was incredibly fun uh, to argue with him about. Until then, he realised that he was thinking of an American children's author named Virginia Woolf, whereas I was talking about the much more well-known English author Virginia Woolf, uh, which just shows you that maybe, before you get into a Twitter argument, a quick round of Google would solve the issue. Anyway, that's an aside. So obviously there is lots of uh, what we would consider literary fiction today that <laughs> you can indulge in in the 20th century uh, with Virginia Woolf specifically. I have read one of her more obscure novels, Night and Day, and I've read her much more famous non-fiction work, A Room of One's Own, and I have been on and off reading Mrs. Dalloway, which has quite weirdly become my dentist read, so I only ever read it when I'm at the dentist. It's on my shelf and I ignore it completely until I have my six months checkup, and then I take it from the shelf put it in my bag and read it in the waiting room. I don't know why, but that means I'll be done reading it in four or five years time. I think we're going to finish this video now. I have no idea how I'm going to edit this into something even slightly cohesive, but uh, this poor little creature has been looking at me all sad because it is eight minutes past her feeding time and um, can't have that, can we? No, we can't have that. Thank you for watching. Bye. You silly little kittle. Are you a silly little kittle that's very hungry? Okay. Okay, let's sort you out. I know.